to start out just asking this basic question of our, our panelists about defining trauma, that what trauma is according to your perspective and why it's relevant to your work, uh, either prefer personally or you know, within the, the matrix of people and organizations that you're a part of. Um, Steve Porges, um, my dear colleague who'd created developed polyvagal theory um, said that uh, trauma is a chronic disruption of connection. And I think if the nervous system was going to answer your question, Scott, that's what it would say. It would say it's a, it's a disruption of the ability to connect either inside um, to others, to the world or to spirit. So it's that disconnected experience that happens. My work um, is helping people learn to tune into that and listen and then honor what they're hearing from their nervous system so that they can then take action. Very simply, trauma is a deep emotional wound. Right? It causes this deep emotional wound. But like, like the trauma in my world, right, in this sort of contemplative world, uh, is a fragmentation or disconnect between mind and body that creates a fundamental belief that we must betray who we are in order to survive, right? So there is, um, to say it in, a, in another way, it creates a situation where we are never at home with ourselves, um, where the mind and body are disconnected in such a way that the mind through memory and imprint can actually continue to traumatize the body. Uh, what I come to understand is that um, Trauma is very much individual, but it's also communal, much like healing is also a communal undertaking. Um, it's an event or an occurrence that touches everyone and everything, right? There is, um, it may have happened to me, but it impacts everyone in my surroundings. And again, healing is much of the same way. Healing is this deep energetic and spiritual communion with yourself and with all things, with the ancestors, with those that are seen and unseen. Um, it's about cartography, not tracing, uh, as Deleuze and Guattari would say. Um, and it allows us to begin the process of coming home to ourselves and feeling safe with ourselves first, before we share that out into the world. I think we have to be quite cautious about how much meditation can actually be the kind of magic bullet that can resolve it because I don't think it is. I think meditation can facilitate certain experiences and certain ways of, of unfreezing what's become stuck in our system. But from my own experience of working in retreats and my own meditation practice and so on, it's about degree. And that, you know, the word trauma, it, it, in a sense, it covers a huge spectrum from trauma that's quite extreme, or we could say every instant of our day is impacting us. Do we call that trauma? Not necessarily. It's usually when it impacts us in a way that we can't cope with it. But then within the context of, of the process of meditation, in some ways meditation can help us to become aware of ways of being with what's arising and enabling it to move through and begin to be healed. But a lot of the time when it's quite strong trauma, Meditation doesn't necessarily always help either. We need a lot more than meditation to be able to, to cope with it. From my own sort of background, I've become very aware that working with people in meditation retreats and so on, many, many ways that people can naturally um, enable emotional wounds and so on to move through and be healed. But then there are, we come up against those aspects of what we might call deeper trauma, where actually it needs a lot more than meditation. and and. And it, it requires a lot more support than just hoping I can sit on my own in my meditation space and, and I will resolve my trauma. It's not as simple as that. I don't know. So, so I think this whole field is something that, that is, um, requires a lot more exploration of the nuances of what can and can't help around how we begin to heal. David, do you want to talk a little bit about how contemplative practices uh, can help with trauma and and where they where they don't help as Rob was talking about. I think um, there was an old Jesuit priest once uh, who was giving a talk and something was happening in the room and he began the talk with every interruption is an invitation. Um, and I thought how profound 
it's true. Um, and that for me is what meditation is in the day. It is an interruption that is an invitation to go deeper, right? To uh, become aware of where my body is out of whack, what I'm feeling in that day, to have uh, an awareness of this arising. And, um, you know, for me, contemplative practice helps us to become more aware of the traumas. It doesn't necessarily heal those traumas, right? There's a whole lot of other work that has to happen on the back end, but it does help, in my opinion, to regenerate and remember uh, our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. It's also about, for me, remembering to give attention to the present moment, to learn to drop down from my mind into my body. Um, that's another thing that we work on a lot in my therapy uh, work is this body practice, right? Um, we become disembodied yeah. uh, when you have experienced trauma, right? Mm. And then it's this disassociation. And so to learn to drop back down in your body, to touch those feelings, to process them and then to let them back up, to let them go, without judgment um, is a practice. Um, and it's one of the ways in which contemplative practices can, again, help us become more aware of them um, and to learn to cope with them better when the body becomes overwhelmed. There's something very, very um, powerful about a sense of home, right? That embodied home and, and, and um, you know, in, in the autonomic nervous system, we all have a home in that state of you know, what we call ventral, that ventral vagal state of regulation and connection, right? And so it lives in each of us. It may, the pathway may be covered up, may, be not, may not have been traveled often or, or recently, but it lives there. It is a biological fact that every human being has this pathway home. And so, you know, what your talking about both of you with contemplative practices or finding ways to safely travel that pathway. Yeah. We are wired to be compassionate beings. And um, Dr. Keltner at the Greater Good Science Center has done a lot of research around, around that. And unless we have enough of that ventral vagal energy alive and circulating in our system, we cannot be compassionate. It, it, it is it is a it emerges from that biological state that autonomic state of of ventral energy and I just find that that both um, wonderful and and terrifying right because it means that every human being has access to compassion and it also means that when I'm not compassionate you know I I can turn toward my nervous system and I can do something to help bring that state back so I can be compassionate. It's not a, it's not a cognitive choice I make. And so I, I do think it's, it's fascinating. I think the research, I, I, I love knowing that we are built to be compassionate, right? We're wired to be compassionate beings. I think that's, that's a beautiful thing to, to know that that science has showed us that. And I know there is some scientific research that shows trauma gets stored somehow physically. And, and I've heard people talk about, you know, releasing trauma and it actually feels like in a specific part of the body that it's released. So can you talk a little in a little bit more detail about how the body plays a role in healing trauma? Because um, I think a lot of us, when we think about contemplation, we think of that as pure mind that we get away from our, from our body. But I think each of you will probably argue something quite different. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, um, Van der Kolk's uh, notion that um, that trauma doesn't it, is not experienced as memory, right? But as uh, disruptive physical reactions, right? That it is literally stored in the cells. Um, and then I go to to epigenetics, right? And that we understand that trauma, ongoing and unresolved, uh, is passed down from generation to generation, right? And as a as a black person in America, as, as an African descended American, I am the living embodiment of at least 15 generations of trauma um, that is um, stored in every cell, every muscle, every organ, um, you know, in yep. all of my physical body. And so 
what I understand about this is that it becomes imprinted on the body, right? In ways that sometimes we can't even recognize until we are experiencing the trauma over again. It's not just the body, it's also how we bring a quality of attention or a quality of awareness into that that enables the, the freedom and the, and the openness for something to be able to then reawaken and move through. But the body is crucial. And I think coming back to some of our original kind of comments, one of the things that has felt tricky for me in relationship to how um, meditation practice can often be brought into our Western experience is that it's very easy for us in the West to become disembodied in our meditation as well. So unless we come back into the body and begin to restore a sort of subtlety of awareness of those processes in the present, then they're not going to heal in the same way. There's a term spiritual bypass. Um, that's a very useful term that's only come up recently and been, been kind of coined recently of, um, you know, kind of using your spiritual practice to escape rather than necessarily process uh, yeah. what happens with you. So can you talk about that? How, especially practically, how do we avoid um, using our spiritual practice or contemplative practice um, as a bypass or checking out compared to acknowledging and transforming trauma? We could get caught up in, in a whole perspective that says these experiences are acceptable and, and to be cultivated, and these are to be rejected and abandoned. And that split, that division of, of these feelings are acceptable, these feelings aren't acceptable, means that we put a lot of things that are maybe naturally part of our emotional life into these unacceptable package, and we can push them into the shadow. And, and if we practice any spiritual path that does that sort of splitting, then we're kind of bypassing in some way. David, any reflections on that avoiding bypass? I've, I've fallen into this trap myself, right? I'm a... Uh, I'm a Catholic Buddhist. Uh, talk about trying to transcend everything, right? Um, our <laughs> spiritual, spiritual bypass, but it is, it's one of those things, what I tell folks is that the moment you find yourself going there, try and pull yourself back down, mm. right? Come back into the world. Um, I think most of the religions of the world are meant to be experienced in the present. Right. Um, and there are narratives that have taken hold and we can, it's a whole different conversation, right, about meta narratives that have taken hold about, you know, you hold on in this world because heaven is your reward and all of those things. Right. But what we have is now, what we know that we have is now. And so we have to live now. Right? As human beings, we're always meaning making um, and suffering is one of those ways that we make sense of the world. And so the only way you will understand your present moment, right, is to experience it, to live it uh, mm -hmm. deeply and try not to transcend it um, or to move through it in ways that you're not recognizing it. I'll, I'll say this and I'll, I'll pass it on to Deb, but my grandmother, God rest her soul, and all of her wisdom would tell me that um, if you avoid the lesson or don't learn it, it will continue to repeat. Mm -hmm. Right? So if for nothing more than that lesson, not repeating, sit in the lesson, right? Sit in the discomfort of the moment of learning the lesson um, so that perhaps it may not repeat and perhaps you may learn something from it. Bless your grandmother. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yes, our, our, you know, these are these habitual response patterns that get set up. And unless we can notice them, name them, and um, honor them for, for why they have come into being and then um, shape them in a new way. And, and I think, I don't know if this is a spiritual bypass, but I think in my line of work, what people do so often is, is they, they want to change the pattern before they sit with it and honor it. Mm. Right. And so the work is to let's, let's be with, let's hear the story. Let's, let's yeah. honor the ways your system has supported your survival. And then we can begin to see what's the gift of that and how can we begin to shape it, shape it differently. I wonder if you can talk about that, the spiritual traditions, you know, contemplative traditions like Christianity, Buddhism, certainly talk about how, you know, suffering uh, when confronted in the right way um, is not only something you can get back to, you know, your baseline, but that it can help you 
expand as a human being. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? You know, so many therapists go into therapy because we, we are our own wounded healer, right? It's, it's, it's that, that piece. And we actually did a, a um, research study at um, the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium of, of um, clinicians and asked about their prior um, traumatic experiences. And it turns out that we do have prior experiences. And, you know, the, the phase-oriented way of looking at trauma treatment is that last phase is the survivor's mission. It's the giving back. It's the, you know, I've made sense of my world. I have now have a coherent story and I um, can use it in, in some way to, to um, pass that on to others. We know it when we reach that point where, where we're no longer um, in that old story, right? We have a new story that's emerging and the new story has um, some passion and has purpose. And I think that's where it then leads us. Mm. I notice this in myself, you know, that I may be experiencing some kind of distress and, and I could respond to that distress with a sense of allowing it to be as it is and to move through, or I could get very contracted around it and it becomes suffering. And that distinction between one and the other, we, we can feel that in our own response, the reaction that we give to things that arise in our life. And, and if, I can, if I can shift the disposition to, to react by contracting and, and getting frozen, it, it's, we come back to the trauma thing again, don't we? It's the contraction freezing that fixes it, that, that solidifies it, that is actually what causes the trauma. That if we can stop that pattern, then it will move through. So there's a, there's a really important but subtle distinction, isn't there, between those two experiences? Yeah. Uh, what I tell folks all the time that contemplative practice, religion, they are methodologies, right? And method is an ontological decision always, right? It's a decision about how you, you be in the world. Uh, and so each religion, each understanding, each philosophy gives us a different way of being with ourselves, each other, and suffering in the world. But I think what they both do is say, this is going to happen. You are going to experience moments of discomfort, of extreme discomfort, of pain, of, uh, of wishing things were different than what they were. They aren't. Mm -hmm. Sit with the fact that they aren't, right? but also that every cloud, every storm runs out of rain eventually, right? And so we will see um, an end to this suffering in some way, depending on your tradition, how that comes about, right? In the Christian tradition, that's death and, and ascension into heaven, right? Um, in, in other traditions, it is uh, coming to a deeper understanding of our total interconnectedness with all things here on earth, right? And then the body going in, going back into that connectedness uh, after, after life. Um, so those things are, are deeply, deeply important. 